One of my two serious passions is playing a round of golf. But do the paranormal and the sport of kings share something in common? You might be surprised to know that there are a number of golf courses that are considered to be haunted. But there is one in the country of Canada whose ghost story is based on real events. And the things credible witnesses have experienced there are extremely strange. Founded in 1893, the Victoria Golf Club features five links along the Strait of Juan de Fuca, with stunning ocean views pretty much everywhere else. But for devotees of the paranormal, its seventh hole has a more disturbing story that features Victoria, British Columbia's most famous ghost. Doris Charnock was employed as a nurse when she met Victor Gravelin, a sports editor of the Victoria, British Columbia newspaper, The Colonist. Gravelin was six years her senior, and while she was very much in love with him, he battled a serious drinking problem that brought much turmoil into their marriage. Despite Victor's efforts to curtail his addiction to the bottle, alcoholism consumed his life and as a result, he eventually lost his job at the paper in 1934. Now unemployed and his dependence on alcohol worsening, his treatment of her took a more hostile turn. So Doris took their seven-year-old son, Walter, and left her husband, taking on the job of a private nurse to a woman named Kathleen Richardson, who lived in the Oak Bay neighborhood. The couple made attempts to reconcile during their separation, but their issues proved too severe to overcome. Nonetheless, while they remained separated, they would still communicate on occasion. On September 22nd of 1936, Victor sent Doris a letter asking to meet her at the Victoria Golf Course at 8 p.m., which was close to the Oak Beach Hotel a place where, in the past, they both enjoyed eating dinner. She said nothing of the meeting to Mrs. Richardson, who nonetheless suspected she was going to see Victor and told her to be careful and to dress warmly for the chilly night. Doris bade her client an early good night so she could arrive there on time. It's been speculated that Victor was making yet another attempt to win her back. She was wearing a knit dress, white shoes, a blue coat, a felt hat, and a sweater. But this would be the last time either she or Victor was seen alive. When Doris didn't return at the time she intended to, and the hours passed, a concerned Mrs. Richardson phoned the police and, acting on her suspicions, suggested they call Victor's parents, with whom he was living at the time. But the Gravelins told authorities Victor hadn't come home that afternoon, and they had no idea where he was. As a result, an APB went out concerning their whereabouts. Five days after their disappearance, a young caddy named John Johnson was searching for lost golf balls near the beach along the 7th fairway, when he saw a pink sweater that seemed to have been left on some logs. As he went over to take a closer look at the clothing, he saw the body of a woman. He called to some young course employees to immediately summon the police, who were quickly able to positively identify the body as that of Doris Gravelin. It was clear she had been beaten and strangled to death, and was fully clothed save for the felt hat she had been wearing, as well as her shoes, which were nowhere to be found. It was determined she had been killed near the sixth fairway, dragged across the seventh fairway, and then down to the beach near the seventh hole putting green. Victor was still unaccounted for, and as such became the prime suspect in her murder. A manhunt for him ensued, but there were no leads as to his current whereabouts. Then five days later, a fisherman rowing in the kelp beds near the ninth hole came upon a man's body tangled in the growth. Police were called, and when the body was pulled from the water, it was identified as that of Victor Gravelin. Searching through his coat, they found Doris' shoes and the felt hat, along with a length of rope. 
Based on an autopsy, it was revealed his death occurred four weeks prior, so it was surmised that immediately after murdering his estranged wife, he then took his own life by drowning himself in the ocean. It became clear that a shocking murder-suicide had taken place, and for all intents and purposes, the case was closed. But Doris appears to have had other ideas. There have been numerous and quite credible claims that her spirit still endures both on and around the Victoria Golf Club. The reports vary from personal anecdotes to full-blown stories appearing in local papers. Because the club is quite accommodating to people who simply want to walk the course after hours or take advantage of the surf fishing available, Doris has been known to show herself to the living during their visits. One early sighting was by a fisherman who had a regular presence there. He was casting from the rocks close to dusk one night when he suddenly felt an eerie sense of unease. Looking behind him, he saw what appeared to be a despondent-looking woman wearing brown clothing from an earlier time, standing just a few feet away from him, staring out into the distance. He was somewhat puzzled because where he was fishing wasn't an easy place to get to, and rarely would a woman venture out there alone. But he said nothing to her or she to him, and he continued fishing. Then after a few more minutes passed, he watched her move quickly down toward his location as if she was heading to meet someone she recognized before simply vanishing before his eyes. He described that as her kind of melting away. The 1960s brought a significant wave of sightings which have continued to the present day. The manifestations vary as she is now often seen dressed in white and sometimes appears to be floating above the grassy terrain of the Seventh Fairway in the very area where her life ended. From there, she is said to either veer off in a different direction or literally ascend into the air and disappear, the latter of which forces those who often believe it is simply someone trying to scare them into questioning their own reality. Light anomalies are another form of her manifestation, but the orbs people claim to see aren't the run-of-the-mill dust particles, but reportedly sometimes the size of a beach ball seen with the naked eye that quite often appear to follow people walking on the notorious 7th fairway back to their cars. Some high school students have described a night where they fled from the light in sheer terror, and upon reaching their car, watched as the anomaly flew over them and then completely engulf their vehicle. Another group of people were taking an out-of-town guest on a walk around the course when the spirit of Doris joined them and began to run in a circle around them, which terrified the guest, who likely never made it to the next hole. In the 1970s and 1980s, a paranormal group comprised of women were regular visitors to the golf course and after hours would head down to the beach where Doris' body was found to sit on the logs there and attempt to make contact with her. After one seemingly failed effort, they started to leave the area as the sun went down, helping each other navigate the uneven terrain, some by holding hands. The woman at the back of the line, noted occult author Jean Kazakari, did the same until she realized every other member of the gathering was already in front of her. She saw no one behind her, but for the rest of her life maintained she was certain it was Doris herself who was helping her along. One particularly intriguing story concerns some family members who experienced something quite remarkable. A pair of grandparents living in Victoria were treated to a visit by their two grandchildren, a boy and a girl. So during their stay, the grandfather decided to take his grandson fishing. Standing on the rocks while casting, the boy got a fish hook stuck in his head that required stitches. Later on that night during dinner, the young man remembered they had left their gear down by the rocks and alerted his grandfather to this. Despite the relative lateness of the hour, everyone piled into the car to go and retrieve it. When they arrived back at the golf club, the grandmother and granddaughter waited in the car while the guys went to find their tackle box. 
After locating it and while walking back to the car, they both saw the figure of a woman dressed in white heading straight for them. It became clear she was not of this world, which caused the boy to shout out in fear. Then in the blink of an eye, the woman was suddenly flying over them, landing a good distance away on the side of a road that cut through the middle of the golf course. The two then watched her run across that road and start back toward them. She remained in pursuit of the frightened males before flying over the car and vanishing. As they entered the relative safety of the vehicle, they saw both the grandmother and granddaughter similarly terrified as they had just witnessed the same thing. Through the many years Doris has been seen, she has become known as the April Ghost, but in reality has been known to appear at any time, late March being the most common time to spot her. There have also been specific times of day her presence is most prominent. Between 4.30 and 5 p.m., she appears to be a normal person walking through the golf course, save for the antiquated clothing she wears. Then more commonly, between the hours of 9.30 and 10 p.m., she appears around the putting green closest to the water where her body was found. Those are typically the most unsettling experiences. But the sightings are not totally limited to the golf course. At the Oakland Bay Hotel, a number of guests staying on the third floor have reported to staff that they have awakened to see a forlorn-looking woman standing by their bed. Leaving the hotel one night, the old mantel clock near the main entrance chimed as the last two staff members locked up for the night. But the chimes had never worked prior to this. An inspection by a clockmaker confirmed the sounding mechanism was fused in place and not capable of chiming. Another night, the last staffer in the building made the rounds to check that all doors and windows were locked and the lights turned off. When he returned upstairs, he heard a sound from down in the next level. As he returned to check what it was, every light was turned back on and all windows and doors were now open. While examining dining room security tapes in order to identify someone who left without paying for dinner, the staff saw a person-like glow of light appear on the tape. The apparition walked through the bar and stopped for a moment before vanishing from the camera frame. Doris has also been known to interact with drivers passing by the golf course by crossing the street in front of them and sometimes even terrifying them by passing right through their windshields and through the car. One legend that is seemingly manufactured about the haunting states that if you ring the brass bell located between the sixth and seventh holes three times, it will summon her ghost. In reality, no one knows why she would be connected to this bell, but it's been speculated that Victor might have rung it the night they disappeared to alert her of his presence. You may also be wondering about what eventually happened to their son. Well, he was eventually adopted by his grandparents and attended school in England, where he went by the name Robin Thompson. He later became a career military man in the British Army, rarely coming back to Victoria. In 1994, a reporter asked him about the ghostly legend surrounding his mother, which came as a total surprise to him. He actually wound up asking the reporter about more details surrounding her death and the stories that followed. The next time he ever spoke of it all, Robin said, if it's history, then it's there, and it's not going away. Doris Gravelin was only 30 years old when her life was taken, so why does she remain or perhaps come in visitation? We can only speculate about that. I think maybe she still doesn't want to reconcile with her ex-husband, although these days they probably travel in very different circles, if you catch my drift. But... If you ever venture into British Columbia and you want to play around, remember to ring that bell on the seventh hole and maybe Doris will let you play through.